Hello, thank you for coming at this obscene hour um, to hear me ramble on. I'm not just a writer, really. I'm a, a brand consultant and a verbal identity specialist, which is not just looking at what people say, but how they say it. I'm interested in businesses that have a purpose and how they articulate that purpose with words. So I work with design agencies, branding consultancies, basically adding the verbal element to their visual. Um, so I'm going to talk about why I think words matter, particularly in our ever-changing, complex world where we're bombarded with information every day. So much content is hurled at us. Um, so I believe that words matter now more than they ever have. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious. Some thrive on comedy. I've sailed upon the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane. I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mirror twins are different, although their features jibe, and lovers think quite different thoughts while lying side by side. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. That's a Maya Angelou piece, I don't know if any of you knew it already. And it's a really powerful emotional advert. And I think words are really represented there, just the beauty of language and what, how it can make us feel. And what interests me is how words make us feel, the reaction we have to reading and hearing words with real power. And in today's world, I just thought that was a really poignant piece to show you all. I thought <coughs> I'd start by talking about words interest me and have since I was really little. I was about nine, I think. I was really into poetry. And Roger McGough, any other fans? Um, I wanted one life, you wanted another. We couldn't have our cake, so we ate each other. I just, I just love how he plays with rhythm and language. And there's just such beauty in the simplicity of it. He doesn't say a lot quite often, but it's so carefully considered. And I think it's really exciting in a world where we need to shout quite loud to be heard, the potential of language to, do, to really engage people and to make them smile. I call it A Smile in the Mind. There's a really good book, I don't know if anyone's ever read it, called A Smile in the Mind. And it's about when you see or read something that just makes you smile in your mind. You just think that is genius, like um, an ad from The Economist. I think their advertising is fantastic. And often it'll be really simple and you'll just think that's genius and it's language, and it's the power of language. Um, Lem Sisse, another <coughs> poet who, very different poet, he's an urban poet, I don't know if anyone's ever been to hear him speak, he's absolutely brilliant. Much more social commentary, really. How do you do it, said Knight? How do you wake and shine? I keep it simple, said Light, one day at a time. I'm really interested in the urban poets of today, Kate Tempest, Holly McNish, there's loads, and Bristol, and this area is rife with people who have words to share with others. Um, the Festival of Ideas in Bristol, I don't know if any of you have ever been to any of the events, they have good poetry evenings. Um, I really recommend, if you're interested in words, going along and, and listening, um, because they're really powerful experiences hearing other people's words. So I couldn't not touch on the language of politics right now there, is so, there are so many words in the news, political language, political rhetoric, which actually has been with us for hundreds and hundreds of years. The way politicians speak, and right now with Donald Trump and Brexit and everything that's going on, I've been fascinated by the language that has fallen out of that world. And I've been laughing at some of the most amazing pieces of copy that people normal everyday people like you and I are just throwing out into the world because they've got to express themselves <coughs> and words are the perfect vehicle for doing that. Julius Caesar said, Vini, Vidi, Vinci, we came, we saw, we conquered. This is, this is just the perfect example of short, staccato, 
bang, bang, bang. It's language that just has so much impact. And I, if you listen to political people speaking, politicians speaking, it's very brief. It's often very emotional. It's intended to build feeling. Actually, it's often intended to make us panic. There's often a sense of increasing panic when you read language from political speakers. So I've just highlighted what I've observed, really, these short staccato sentences. There's certainty and determination. There's a sense that people are driving an idea. There's an emotional build-up. This is called parataxis, which I didn't know, but I did some research. Um, and it, it really provokes feeling. And I don't know if you've all noticed yourself reacting to people speaking politically, but it's incredibly powerful. Donald Trump's a really good example. He doesn't finish sentences. I mean, at the moment, he's taken it on, he's gone off piste with political language, and I'm not going to start ranting about him, but I think it's really interesting how he doesn't finish sentences. There's never a conclusive point. Quite often, it's very vague, which is actually the antithesis of this. There's a lack of certainty. So I've just highlighted some good. Obama came along. He had one word behind his campaign, hope. And it was exactly what the American people needed to hear. Whether they bought into him or believed it or not, just the power of this one word. An amazing piece of design as well. Um, my background is in design. I ran a design agency for 12 years. So I'm very visual, as very verbal, as well as verbal. Um, and I just think this is a great example of the power of the visual with the verbal. Together, they create this very powerful vehicle for communication. Again, The Economist. It's just, just brilliant. And so simple, so beautifully simple. And it's one of those where you go, damn, why didn't I do that? Um, because it's great. And it's a smile in the mind. And actually, a, a, a laugh out loud. And then here we've got you know, that kind of panicky language that's designed to drive us all into this state of you know, let's take back control. There's a real sense of feeling behind it. And I don't doubt for a minute that the people behind this campaign believe what they're saying. Um, but there are lies. You know, and it's, it's just really, it's interesting to me that words are this vehicle for so much feeling in a nation. And then I've included some ugly. Um, which is just astounding from my perspective. Um, but again, language. Um, it's quite informal language. But it's telling everybody what we have to do. There's no doubt that we have to do it. Whether you, you know, this is what they're telling us. So this freedom of expression, what I find fascinating is that right now we've had marches. People are more politically demonstrative than ever before. I mean, I've. I've never been so engaged as a voter, and I've never been so, and maybe it's because I'm a wordsmith, but I'm really interested in all of the banners we've seen at marches. Um, they've been all over the internet because some of them have been genius, and it's, do you want to go through here? And it's, it's a bit like the miners' strike. It, during the miners' strike back in the 80s, people started to put out their own words. Everyday people at home made banners. And it was the most creativity, and I, I think, Periods of massive change just provoke such feeling in people. And what interests me is the language that falls out of those, those eras. <laughs> Again, we're, we're ad-libbing. We're just, we're just we're doing our own thing. And it's just brilliant. These are just normal people opening up a design software package and trying to make it their own because we need to express ourselves. And, I think it's brilliant that words are a vehicle for this, and we can, you know, I will not go quietly back to the 1950s. And I love the juxtaposition between the person and how you perceive them and what they're saying. It's just, it's just a great display of creativity. <laughs> um, it's just brilliant. Um, you know, it's just been made at home. And this is all language. So apologies if we have any Trump supporters here. Um, 
But <laughs> I, just, I just think it's great that language has enabled us to, well, it's made us laugh. But in a time like this, we need to laugh. We, know, we need to be united in something positive, otherwise we'll cry. And so, as I said at the beginning, we live in a, in a culture of throwaway words, digital communication. Every day, how many emails do you get? How many emails with so many words? But I think we're at saturation point. And I know sometimes I don't read things anymore. And it becomes just too much to take in all this stuff. And I think this is an opportunity, really. So we're bombarded every day. I think an average social network user processes 54,000 words, 443 minutes of video every day. And those are active social network users. And I know people that abstain and just you know, shut themselves away from it. But it's, it's a real opportunity <coughs> to, to use language well and actually cut through noise so you can be heard. And I guess that is, that is my job, is to work with people, individuals, businesses, charities, so to give them a voice so that they are heard in a, in a world which is just overloaded with language. Twitter's a really good example. It's really powerful when it's used really well. Um, lots of brands really harness the power of Twitter to get across their messages. Nike's a good example. Um, they did this Find Your Greatness campaign during the Olympics in 2012, and it was all about individuals finding their greatness. It was whoever you are, whatever you do, you have your own greatness. Everybody's an athlete. Um, so it was a, this inclusivity thing. And it was all over Twitter. Everybody was involved. It had, they had such a ridiculous response. And the interesting thing was, they weren't the main sponsor. I think it was Adidas that were the main so, um, sports sponsor of the Olympic Games. And yet they completely usurped them in terms of how much noise they made because they used language really well, they used social media really well, and it was really consistent and really joined up. So used badly, it can be really, really detrimental to a company or a, a brand. And uh, McDonald's is a good example. I don't know if anyone was familiar with this. They had this McDonald's Stories campaign where they asked everyday people to send stories to Twitter and they were awful. People were saying, ate a McFish and vomited one hour later. The last time I got McDonald's was seriously 18 years ago in college. And they opened the floodgates to this barrage of absolute abuse. And the PR people had to quickly take it down, like get the campaign down, because Twitter is just like a, you know, a vehicle for thinking. Everybody just downloads what they're thinking. And it was horrendous from a PR and brand perspective. So if you hadn't gathered, I think this. You know, they're more important now than ever. Um, so I, I think that good words, they raise a smile, they touch us at our core, they change our mind, they challenge perception, they enrage, they sadden, they provoke, they bring joy, they trigger memories, they distress, they make us think, they bring people together, they divide people, they build bonds and they connect us and they engage. And so much more beyond that. So I'm interested in, in storytelling, and all of us have a story to tell. And it's really hard to tell your own story. One of the most difficult briefs I had was to write my own website copy. I don't know if any of you have tried to write about yourselves. And it's really difficult. Um, I work with a lot of design agencies, digital agencies, to articulate who and what they are. I've just done. I've brought these brochures in. I just worked with Fiasco Design in Bristol to help them produce this new business brochure, which is just a tool for them to use. And they said, we just can't express who we are and what we are. So I ran a workshop with them to explore that. It wasn't just about the language. It was about what is your purpose? Why are you here? What gets you out of bed in the morning? Um, so I do a lot of that, the digging before the writing, the finding out why, why people do what they do. Because actually, that's what people are interested in. Sometimes it's not what you do, it's why you do it. It's what drives it. So advertising is a good example where words are fundamental to the success of an advert. If you think about adverts you like, can anybody think of anything they've seen that they love? Off the cuff. Putting you on the spot. 
So the Guinness advert's a good example. The, the, um, I don't know if you remember the really old Guinness advert where the surfer, with the surfer, the words are absolutely amazing, but they work inextricably with the visual language. Together, they create a really potent combination, and I was really blown away by that advert. And this was, it was years ago. It was like early 90s, I think. Madonna Buter, an 86-year-old nun... Oh, sorry, sister. Sister Madonna Buter, 86 years old, goes for a morning run. Good for you, sister. She's still active at her age. That's great. Oh, maybe a little too active. Nap time, sister? I don't think so. The sister doesn't think so. Okay. Wait, what? Iron Man. Oh, no, 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 no. This is a bad idea, sister. A real bad idea. Somebody Relax, stop. she's the Iron Nun. But she won't make it. This is an Iron Man. The first 45 didn't kill me. You've done 45 of these? Okay. Do your thing, sister. Do your thing. So, that tells a great story. It's really informal. It has a tone of voice that we engage with. It's really everyday. It's really conversational. I, you feel like they've just spoken to you directly. Um, and that's brilliant storytelling. Um, if anybody's interested, there's a really good book here. Um, these series of books are called Do Books, and I can't recommend them enough. They're just really accessible, bite-sized chunks of information. And this is how to tell your story to the world so it listens. And they're really nice books if you're interested. There's another one about purpose. I've just put them there as reference. So this is all about cutting through the noise of the world we live in and the amount of information we get bombarded with. Um, I thought I'd start by explaining how I found myself as a writer because it was actually... I, I love words, I always have, but I studied Italian at university and art history. So I was a linguist. I lived in Italy for a long time and... To be a linguist, you have, many of you maybe know, you have to learn to use English really well. Um, but actually, I was more interested in the expression, not the grammar. I felt frustrated and restrained by that. And what interests me is how language evolves, how in Italy there are about six or seven versions of Italian, depending on where you live. I think there are like five words for cucumber. I mean, it's, it's really interesting that it's a really devolved language. And here we talk about the Queen's English. And we, people are really wedded to this idea that there is a proper way to speak. Um, and I'm not sure there is. And I, I'm really interested in how language evolves. And I think it's a living thing. And we should allow it to evolve and change and permeate culture and, and, and stimulate us to come up with new words. Um, so I worked at Browns, which was a design agency in London for about 10 years. And we did a campaign and a project for a charity called The Climate Group. And they wanted to communicate with governments and senior corporate people about the impact of climate change and how it was going to change our world. And they came to us and they said, nobody's listening to anybody about this issue. All of the charities are, are a sea of green and blue. It's not arresting enough. It's not making people sit up. It's all the same. So we designed this logo. This was their logo, which was the degree symbol. Um, and they still exist. And we decided to create an exhibition about climate change. And it was called North, South, East, West. And we got 10 Magnum photographers to go around the world photographing the impact of climate change. So Polynesia, um, where did they go? They went to the Antarctic. We sent them everywhere, California. And the photographs were absolutely beautiful. And this exhibition and this book went around the world. It was at Brussels, the European Union. Um, it was in, in the Science Museum in London. But the language was absolutely paramount. And this is where I started writing, because they didn't have very much budget. And I said, this is so important, I want to do it for nothing. I've just, it's just such an important issue for my own kids. I just feel like I need, to, I need to be involved. So I helped them to create this tone of voice that was really hard hitting. It wasn't aggressive. It just was really to the point and direct. There was no room for gray area. It was just, these are the facts. And this was where I started playing with tone and voice and how, not what we say, but how we say it. And this was the exhibition in the Science Museum. Um, 
And it was really, the, the images were hero, but the words needed to sort of reflect their immediacy. Um, I also worked on the World Cup bid book for England 2018 and 2022, which we didn't get. Um, and that was, I proofread this, and it was like a tome, it was like this big. And it was content that had come from a million different sources. I mean, literally, the government, the sports council, like everywhere, everybody sent this content in, and we had to try and make it uniform. And it was a massive headache, this job. Um, and I was so sad that we didn't get it because it was such a strong case. It was such a football nation that it made complete sense. And obviously, it was, wasn't about fine. The decision was financially driven, I'm sure. Um, but it was a really interesting project. And um, this is another project where the image is a hero again, but there are bits of copy that were really important. So this was a real exercise in when you had a voice, using it really well and choosing your words really carefully. This is Invesco Perpetual, a fund management business. I do quite a lot of work in that field. Um, who didn't want to sound like a, a boring fund management business, and they, they really wanted to find a voice that was more engaging to people. Um, they, they, they talked to us about sounding more like a BMW or a Nike, and not just being part of a sector and associated with that sector. So I've worked with them. I still work with them now. Um, on what they say and how they say it. So I suppose what I learned then was that good design needs good words and good words need good design. The two things are inextricably linked and they're so important, they complement each other. And when, historically, people haven't thought about words. I don't know if any of you work in the design industry or, and quite often in the past we would design something and have lorem ipsum on the page, not real copy. And the words would be an afterthought. And that's changing. I'm often briefed now at the start of a design project, and I work closely with the creative team and from a strategic point of view about what people want to say. Because it's not just about the vehicle for those words, the visual. They, they just need to work together, and I think we're, we're learning that. I often get asked to speak to lawyers, people that use complicated language. Um, we all learn at school, at university, to write in a certain way. And it really interests me that there are certain professions who can't leave anything out. Being concise is actually really hard. Um, my sister's partner is a CEO of a, a software business, and he asked me to help him to be more precise and more concise in what he writes, because he just can't edit it down. Because as a lawyer, he was trained to say everything, to cover himself. And it's... it's Less is more, I really believe that, and I think with language it's really important to be disciplined in what you say. So, it's a really good quote. I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. You probably all know that quote, and it's, it's brilliant. There's so much truth in that. Um, I often get given <coughs> copy that has come from a client and asked to refine it. Um, which usually means editing it down, but cont capturing the same meaning. Um, and it's a difficult job, it really is. Um, but I, I like the challenge of doing that. So I just thought I'd show you a few examples of my work. I've put some examples on the table here. Um, really diverse, I work with small businesses in this area, charities, big branding agencies in London. Um, but I'm freelance, as Alex said, and I just go in for a few days and do what I need to do, often working with teams or remotely. Um, the Internet Society was a job I did with a company called Moving Brands, and they are a, an NGO whose remit is to protect the foundations that the Internet was built on and to make sure that it evolves sustainably and in a positive way. They're all techie geeks. I mean, the language they used when they showed me was so complex and so detailed and and I said, this isn't going to reach normal people. And what they wanted to do was open it up to people because they were having an event with the UN. So I, I took all of their content and tried to stream it back and to simplify it. This was their original logo. Um, and this was the type of content on their website. <laughs> I mean, if they could speak in code, they would. And 
I thought it was a really great challenge actually because what they do, the essence of it is fantastic and important given how unruly the internet is. And it's bigger than us, it feels bigger than us, it feels like this thing that has grown and grown and grown and is, it is bigger than us and I think it was interesting to me, an exercise in kind of making sense of it. Um, so they didn't want to change their logo which is a, often the case. So we just looked at messaging, key messaging that, that told people what they needed to know, bring the local content to Africa. A new report says that internet access and availability are not enough to get Africa online. We need local content in local languages. It's really simple. It just says what it needs to say. Um, and often people can get bogged down in the detail and lose sight of that pertinent message that sits at the heart of everything. So they asked me to write a mission statement. The internet has transformed our lives. This world of opportunity reflects all that we are as humans and enables us to explore and discover our full potential. Infinite possibility is a thing of greatness, but it demands experience, knowledge, and care. The internet society is fundamental to this. this these words were part of an event they did in New York for the UN, and they wanted something that, that would capture how they felt. Because quite often we leave emotion out of business language. We leave emotion out because we think it's unprofessional. But actually, in this context, it was really important that I expressed what motivated them and you know, what was behind this complex organization. So we did some big banners that were at JFK Airport. Um, and they were just really simple. You know, again, visuals working with verbal, visual and verbal together, creating this consistency in messaging. So another, another part of what I do, not just rewriting people's words is, or editing them, is I find a voice for them. And this is known as tone of voice. I don't know if everyone's familiar with it. And it's, a, it's becoming a bit, something that people find a bit annoying. Um, so I'm trying to find a new expression for tone of voice because it's kind of verbal identity, if you like. And I work with people, <coughs> excuse me, like Microsoft. I work with Wagamama in finding a unique voice for them. And often it isn't unique. I think Innocent Smoothies was really unique. Um, but everybody sort of sounds increasingly the same. But I, I think whatever voice you have, it's important that it represents who you are. And if you're an informal person to do business with and you, you need to sound accessible, not friendly, but accessible. So I often work with in individuals and small businesses on creating a unique voice so that they sound different to their competitors. Um, and there are lots of voices that you'll all be fami familiar with. We go into supermarkets and shampoo talks to us now. You know, we're in a world where it's a bit saturated. The innocent smoothie thing has annoyed everybody. There's a real backlash to that. You know, I don't want to be friends with my smoothie. It's like, can you stop? this really informal, wear a bubble hat kind of language, it's, it's become annoying. Um, at the moment, I'm working with an immersive theatre company in Bristol, helping them develop a voice and um, naming their business. I run a lot of naming workshops, and we had a workshop in Bristol yesterday. And these guys are three graduates who, who are their performers. And they're so effervescent as people. They are just full of energy. And I really had to capture this sense of energy without alienating corporate clients because they want to do commercial theatre for brands. But it was, it's a real balancing act, expressing their personality while sounding serious and, and respected, earning respect through what you say. So tone of voice or verbal identity is, is how I said what I said, tone and message. You know, it's how you put your words together. Whether you use contractions, do you say we will or we'll? That's quite a distinct difference. Um, how short are your sentences? How often do you use colons? Do you ever use an exclamation mark? For me, that's a definite no-no, whatever business you're in. I have a real problem with exclamation marks. <laughs> um, so in the absence of a human voice, brands have to create their own businesses, or brands, whatever you want to call it, they have to have a voice. 
And I just believe that in today's world, that's more important now more than ever. But it has to be done with restraint and with an understanding of the audiences you're dealing with. You know, one of my job is to sit down and think about whatever I'm writing. Who is this aimed at? Who are they? What, what do I want them to think, feel, and do when they read this? Am I selling something, or am I just informing them about something? So all of these things are considerations. If any of you write, I'm sure you come at it in the same way. It's, it's the output. Who is the person reading it? So I thought I'd include a job I did for Microsoft. Um, they have a tone of voice. I didn't have anything to do with it. It's very clear. You probably know what it is just from reading anything they've ever put out into the world. Um, this is what they say about their tone of voice. Our voice is like an old friend, sometimes someone you trust and rely on. They've got your back. You know what to expect, no surprises. They're positive. They see the best in you and inspire good things. It's relaxed and easy. No need to waffle on. Less is more with, t with just a touch of feeling. And it's funny, when I show this to people, and people feel a bit annoyed sometimes. It's like, oh, we're all such mugs. You know, we, we read all this stuff, and we don't think about the layers behind it. You know, it is, it's marketing-driven. It's got there's an objective, a sort of bottom-line objective behind it. Um, but I really like how they express this. And I get it. When I read their stuff, it's really obvious. So I did um, a series of huge posters to launch their new browser, Microsoft Edge. I don't know if anyone knows about it. It's a web browser where you can interact with the page. You can copy and paste content. You can annotate. So it's basically giving power back to the user is the premise of it. Do self-expression. Microsoft Edge, your canvas. Sketch, doodle, write, read, build, create. The browser that celebrates the art of doing. So basically, I was given some visuals and asked by the agency to come up with some copy to go with them. Um, so this is a good example of the kind of thing I do. So it, I might write something long, a brochure, a website, or something really brief and immediate. Taking the brow out of browsing. Microsoft Edge, the browser that works as hard as you do. Turn chaos into calm, cluttered into clean, freedom from the unnecessary. We don't do search, we do found. Here's another um, example of a world of massive complexity. This is Merck. If anybody's familiar with Merck, they're a massive pharmaceutical company who are responsible for really groundbreaking oncology treatment, fertility treatment. Um, and in contrast to the pharmaceutical world that we've all read about, they're a family-owned business based in Germany, and they are passionate about changing the world. I interviewed about 15 scientists as part of my remit to really get under the skin of who they were. Um, and I just felt really privileged, actually, to meet these people who were so good at what they do. And it, you know, thanks to them, they were really pioneering in terms of cancer treatment. And the way they spoke to me just blew my mind. They were so full of feeling about what they were doing, the reasons for doing it. But the voice they had online in their brochures was so corporate. And I said, well, there's no passion in any of your content. And only a little bit is appropriate, clearly. But I just felt like we had to capture a little bit of it. Um, so I work with Future Brand, who are one of those big global branding agencies who redesigned them, their logo. And this was slated. I don't know if any of you read about it. It was, one, it was like the Olympic logo. Wolf Hollins did. They absolutely panned them for this. And they said it's like some sort of horrific 1960s psychotic episode. You know, there was some really bad press about it. And it was really, it was a real shame because it kind of masked what this was intended to do. It was intended to capture this sense of vibrant science. And also, the, these kind of, the design of this is based on cells, the kind of molecular cells that morph and change. So it's a an evolving identity. It doesn't stay the same. It's a very digital identity. Um, anyway, it got lost behind the criticism, which is often what happens. So I just thought I'd put this brochure in, which I wrote. And it's basically their sales brochure, if you like. And I just did the, the, the headline copy. And creating a brighter world, the little sparkle goes a long way. Being the global market leader in effect pigments, we add shimmer to the paint on your car, sparkle to the lipstick, and luminescence to the coating on your packaging. So it was just this idea of bringing it to people in your real lives. 
how does this brand affect me? And nobody knew. Nobody knew that so often what we were interacting with was part of something they'd done, a science or a technology. Um, I've included some work I did recently in this area. Um, so this was for Supple Studio in Bath, working for um, a social regeneration organization. We developed an app which enabled small businesses, independent businesses, to measure the impact of their business within a local community. Um, so we named it, ran a naming workshop, and it, the, the end result was Twine. Um, and I wrote the copy for the website, working with Jamie and a web agency in Bath. Um, this was recently, this recently went live. Twine is good at making sense of data. As a business owner, you'll know how well you're doing depends on how well connected you are to your neighborhood. Twine can, help you, Twine can help you understand the important relationship between the two by collecting the data and joining the dots. So it was all about this idea of joining dots, hence the logo. Um, and then fiasco design, which is something I did literally in the past couple of months. I've got some brochures there. Um, this was really difficult for them to capture who they are and put it into words. Um, and it was a real pleasure to work with them, actually, because it was really important that they were reaching more people. And so we had a really good workshop. We called it a brand workshop, but it was really getting all of the staff around a table and saying, what do you do here? What do you think is important about your offer? What is the purpose of what you do relative to your competitors or, or your peers? Um, I won't read it out, but this was us capturing the very essence of who they are. We did a really good exercise about purpose, um, which was all about, I don't know if anyone's ever done this exercise, it's quite a good, good thing, you might want to do it after, after, while I finish speaking. You have three circles and a Venn diagram effectively, and you draw, the, you, write, you draw them overlapping and in the middle is the purpose, and in one circle you write your passion, in another you write what you love, so in one, one's your passion, one is what you're good at, and one is what the world needs that you offer. And you write each thing in a circle, and then you get to your purpose in the center as a result of thinking about these three. Your passion, what you're good at, and what the world needs that you bring. And it's a really, it was um, actually in my book, Do Purpose, that I didn't write. It's a really good book um, by a local Southwest person, I believe. Um, so that's the fiasco brochure that feel free to have a look at. We came up with these, they, they work with these sort of brand pillars, so creativity takes courage, together is better. And they already had those, but they asked me to kind of articulate them, to expand on them. I did this recently for the for, um, University of West of England. They have just, you may be aware, opened a kind of tech hub, if you like, um, at their French A site. And um, it's just, it's basically the robotics labs and space for technology focused businesses. It's like an incubation space. And they're wanting to harness local science innovation talent. And so there's this kind of subsidized space for working with really well kitted out labs. And so we named it Future Space. I ran a naming workshop. Um, and I'm actually writing, this is the website at the moment, but I'm writing their website at the moment. I wrote that bit of copy. Um, so that's it really, people need words, is my conclusion. Um, I don't know if you feel like doing a little task. Um, it's quite a tricky one. It's a haiku, is everyone familiar with what that is? So it's an exercise in freeing your mind. It's something I often do with people at the start of a workshop because corporate people or people that work in quite rigid environments find it hard sometimes to be creative. And often it's in them, but they're just not used to, to doing it. And this is quite a good way of using words to get into a creative headspace. Um, so it's a very short form of Japanese poetry using 17 syllables. And you don't have to do it, but if you feel like going away and doing it, you could send it to me on Twitter, um, which is what happened last time. Um, here are the rules. So it's three lines broken down like this. Line one is five syllables. Line two is seven, line three is five. Um, sorry, that should say morning. Write about the morning, the subject matter, and your experience and observations. And, and the, the objective is to make two clear points. 
So consider the mood in the room, your senses, the location, what's going on outside, and your own thoughts that might be clouding the experience. Um, I'll put some examples in. A meeting of words, the harbour whispers stories of sailors and ships. A meeting of words. Do you see how it works? Um, and in Japan, they're brilliant. If you have a look online, there's some amazing examples. They can be quite emotional things. They're often about people's feelings. The tree shape I blew from a little drop of paint looks like a dancer. I really like that one. Um, but it can be anything. It could be literally about your coffee. But I think it's quite interesting, the exercise of being really disciplined. It's like writing a tweet. I know that when Twitter first arrived, I was like, what? I can't contain that in 140 characters. Um, so I think it's a good challenge. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you.